Let's have a moment of prayer before we open God's word. Dear loving Father in heaven, we're just thankful that you're a God who is always with us. Whether we're worshiping at home, whether we're on the road, whether we're in private or in public, whether in your, in your house, that you've promised to be with us when we worship you. And so we claim that promise today, Lord. We ask that the Holy Spirit be present in a very special way as we open your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some enchanted evening, you may see a stranger. You may see a stranger across a crowded room. You've never met, but your eyes just did. You exchanged smiles. A spark jumped the gap all the way across the room. From you to them, the heart begins beating faster. Love. Love at first sight, beautifully romantic. It sells movies and magazines and books by the truckload. There's just one problem, taint so. As any good psychologist can tell you, love takes time. Love at first sight is actually just someone that conforms to a preconceived image that you have carried in your mind of the kind of person that you're hoping to meet and fall in love with. You can be wonderfully attracted at first sight, and you may later fall in love. But love at first sight, no. Love takes time. Maybe alone or perhaps in a congregational setting, you respond to the working of the Holy Spirit upon your heart and you make a new decision and take a fresh stand. From now on, you are going to love Christ for the rest of your life. Not necessarily so. And if someone here has made that kind of a decision to follow Christ and you found that you're not following through very well, it doesn't mean that the decision was not real or that, or that the conversion was hypocritical. It's just that you can't love even Jesus unless you go on from there and spend time together because love takes time. Father was dashing out the front door on his way to the car, rushing off to work. And he passed by his son who was standing in the front yard with a ball glove in one hand and a ball in the other. The father, meaning to be very kind and thoughtful father, said, Hi, son, I love you. And the boy said, Dad, I don't want you to love me. I want you to play catch with me. For not spending time with these children of ours, they have a right to wonder if we love them. Because love takes time. Let's let those three words surround us this morning. Love takes time. Point number one. A love relationship with your marriage partner will grow only if you take time to be together. Open your Bibles now to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Ephesians chapter five. In verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. A husband is supposed to love his wife in the same way that Christ loves his church. And in what kind of a way does Christ love the church? Christ loves the church in such a way that he spends his time establishing a relationship with his church, with his people. 
time listening to their prayers, time forgiving their sins, time helping them to grow. Now our text says, husband, love your wives even as Christ loves. If Christ loves the church in such a way that he spends his time and his attention in establishing a relationship, then according to this verse, a husband is supposed to spend time establishing a relationship with his wife because that's the way Christ does with his church. Ladies and gentlemen, the American home is in deep trouble. Every year there are well over a million divorces. This morning, I surely do not mean to discourage or condemn anyone who has lived through this frightful experience called divorce. Those who have experienced it, my heart goes out to you this morning. Because however you describe it, divorce is a shootout between Siamese twins. It makes no difference who wins. They both lose. Seventh-day Adventist homes are failing. Fully one half of all U.S. marriages end in divorce. That figure for Adventist marriages and for Christian marriages in general is almost as bad as the general public. However, can that happen? What is it that goes wrong? It's not that we change our thinking about the permanence of the home overnight. What happens is that, yes, we believe in a strong commitment, but we become awfully good at coming up with exceptions. They certainly did in Jesus' day. A man could divorce his wife in Jesus' day for just about any reason. For example, if he found his wife flirting with another man, grounds for divorce or if she didn't get along with his mother, or if she argued so loud that it embarrassed him in front of the neighbors, if she burned his food, or if he simply just found another woman that he liked better. For the ladies, it was a little tougher. She too could get a divorce if her husband got leprosy or some other kind of terrible, undesirable trait, or of course, if he left the faith. We become awfully good at coming up with exceptions as well. Oh, I believe in the permanence of marriage, but have you met my ex? Then you would understand. In my case, you see, it's different. Or in the case of my family, in the case of my friend, there's an exception to be made. But folks, as you study the words of Jesus, he did not make any exceptions except, of course, for adultery to the lastingness of the home. We are influenced so much by society and by what we spend our time doing. If your standards for the home have lowered in the last few years, I'll just bet you're spending more time with the television than you are with the scriptures. If adultery doesn't seem to be so sinful to you anymore, I dare say you've been spending much more time with the TV or the phone or the computer or some other things than you are with your Bible. If you feel that Christ condones divorce, you've been spending more time feeding on the world than feeding on the words of Christ. Christ reaffirmed the permanence of the marriage relationship. But that's kind of the negative side. And Christ, you know, doesn't ask us to live together in order to make our lives miserable. Christ wants our homes to be happy. He wants them to succeed. And one of the basic requirements of a home succeeding is two people deciding that we are going to make this work. A number of years ago, I saw an interview with a Hollywood celebrity couple, very famous couple. I wish I could remember who it was because it's ones that we would, most of us would know very well. But for some reason, I, you know, that should be kind of a small sample size if, if you have a Hollywood couple staying together for 50 years. But 
They were asked during the interview the secret to their success. However, in this glamorous life when people usually don't stay together for five minutes, what is your secret for success? And they replied in just two words to that question. We promised. We promised. Now, our theme this morning says that making marriage work takes time. All of this unhappiness and this failure would be so unnecessary if we just spend time. First of all, we need to spend time talking together with our partners. We are so busy. Now, folks, if the Lord had intended that you talk more than you hear, he would have given you two mouths and one ear. It's absolutely essential that we talk with our partners because the human ego demands that there be someone who thinks we're important enough to listen to. And if nobody will listen to you, you begin to look upon yourself as a nobody. There's not much obligation on the part of the world out there, and that's why the Lord gave us homes, so that there would be at least one person in this whole world that cares about what I am thinking. There was a very wise health counselor in a community. He was recu recruiting counselors for a stop smoking clinic to be held at the church. The prospective helper said, oh, we don't know anything about helping people stop smoking. And he said, all you have to do is know two words. If you can just repeat these two words, if you can promise to me you will not forget those two words, you will be an overwhelming success as a counselor. The two words, uh-huh. Well, you know, I've been smoking for over 25 years. Uh-huh. I know how bad it is for my health. Uh-huh. I've tried to stop before, but it's so hard. Uh-huh. All you've got to do is listen. Oh, how the world needs good listeners. We see it so much in this era of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Millions of people just putting their lives, their voices out there, just wanting someone to pay attention to them, to listen to what they have to say, to what's going on in their lives, what they're having to eat even. to acknowledge them, to care what they have to say. And if you feel like you're doing pretty well in your marriage listening, may I suggest the postgraduate course is not only to listen to what your partner says, but to listen to how your partner feels. So many times, especially for the men, we find it so difficult to really put directly into words our feelings. And yet we want our feelings understood. And we kind of talk all around the subject. We really have learned to talk and listen when we not only hear words, but we understand how our partner feels. And so first of all, time talking together. Secondly, time working together. Our society has a problem here that was not so much a part of the American dream a number of generations back. Way back, you know, when the pioneers came to the homestead, he and she built the house together, and when the house was built, they had something that they had done together. This was theirs. And when they broke the sod, they took turns following the plow, and if the farm was a success, they stood back with their arms around one another. They had done something together. But now one of you goes east and one of you goes west and never the twain shall meet. May I make a little suggestion that at least we could still work together when we're at home together. I know you guys aren't crazy about housework and maybe not cooking and you ladies may not be wild about yard work or mechanics. We're inclined to divide. She goes over here in her sphere and does her thing and he goes over here and does his thing. 
I'll tell you something, I'm not very crazy about doing dishes either, but after a big meal, when there's a huge pile of dirty dishes in the kitchen, there's kind of a warm satisfaction when the two of you do the dishes together. Because there is great satisfaction in a job well done. And when it, that job has been done, the two of you together, there comes a warmth, there comes a togetherness, a sharing. Love takes time to work together. Thirdly, love takes time to play together. Here's where a lot of marriages get into early trouble because, you know, virtually all the time you spent together before you got married was playtime, wasn't it? The realities of life don't allow that to continue and it changes almost instantly when the honeymoon is over. But how you spend your recreation time says a great deal about your relationship because spending recreation time with your partner is one of the most flattering things you can do. You see, most of our time is demanded of, of us. Well, I have to go to work. I have to have time for sleep. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to run errands here. I have responsibilities out there. The one time that I have a choice over my time is my recreation time. And when, whenever I have a choice, I like to spend it with you. That is one of the most flattering things that can happen to a marriage partner. Now that's not easy, not if she enjoys a walk at sunset or sewing or online shopping and he enjoys golfing and hiking and fishing. But if you'll experiment, you can find something, maybe a shared hobby, hobby, maybe showing an interest in each other's hobbies, or maybe the time that you have recreation time together, just going out to eat together, or going on a walk together, doing something in your free time together. Because when we play together, it brings us together. Most young people are inclined to think that marriage begins with a prince kissing an angel and winds up with a bald-headed man sitting across the kitchen table from a slightly overweight woman. But let me tell you something. If that bald-headed prince and that slightly overweight angel have through the years spent time together, they have a relationship, they have a rapport, they have a closeness that you hairy princes and you skinny angels cannot comprehend. Because love takes time. Isn't it an exciting thought that we could become more and more and more in love? all the rest of our lives. That's what our theme says this morning. The more time you spend together, the more you ought to love each other. And that kind of a marriage never gets boring. It's always growing. Point number two, the love relationship with your child will grow only if you spend time together. Please turn to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29. One of the reasons the Lord gave us a home was so the children would have an acceptable model. Our Heavenly Father gave dads so that boys would have somebody to fashion their lives after. You hear the story about the young boy who was went to the barber shop and sat in the barber's chair and he was ready to get his hair cut. And the barber said, how do you want your hair cut? And he said, I want it just like my dad's. And don't forget the hole in the top where the head comes through. Someone has said that the boys pattern their lives after their fathers in spite of all efforts to teach them good manners. It was God's intention that parents serve as models, but notice now Proverbs 29 and verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. A child left to himself. 
child left to himself. Our generation is not being very successful in getting children to pattern their lives after their parents. Why? Because their children are left way too much to themselves. The American child spends many times as much time in front of the television or a tablet or video games or texting or talking on the phone as he does alone with his parent. If your child is patterning himself after what he sees on TV and other devices more than after dad, it's almost certain that he is seeing much more of these other things than he is of dad or even mom in many cases. A number of years back, a survey was taken of 7th and 8th graders, 300 of them, 7th and 8th graders. And they were asked to write down and record how much time they spent with their fathers. How much time do you spend one-on-one -on -one with your father? Add up all the minutes each day and then for the whole week. And according, or actually two weeks, and according to this survey, the average American young teenager, at least in this survey, spends with his father per week, can you venture a guess how much time? Seven and a half minutes. One-on-one -on -one time with dad per week, about a minute a day. That's about one out of every 1,440 minutes of each day is spent one-on-one -on -one with the Father. Love takes time. How can there be a bond of love between parents and children if there is no time together? And you young fathers, far better, better to start while your child is young. How many times I've wished I were just half as wonderful as my grandchildren thought I was and only half as stupid as my teenagers thought back in the day. Love takes time. And finally, the third point I want to make is that a love relationship with Christ will grow only if you take time to be together. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew, chapter 28. Jesus leaving the disciples. He closes the book on his ministry, the climax of his teaching. Matthew, the 28th chapter, the 20th verse, the last verse in the book of Matthew. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I am with you always. Do you realize what that means? It says that Jesus loves you so much that he wants to be with us all of the time. He is always available to us. How much time have you spent with him since last Sabbath? People are often very worried about their Christian experience. Well, I just don't seem to be growing as a Christian as much as I ought to. But listen, your Christian experience doesn't grow through worrying about it. Your Christian experience grows through spending time together with Christ. It's as simple as that. What can I do? What can I do to improve my relationship? Just spend some time together with Christ in your own way, in your own time. But be sure it's time together with Christ because love takes time. The book Steps to Christ, page 68, says, The plants and flowers grow, not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot by any anxiety or power of its own add to its stature. When I was a senior at Thunderbird Academy, I befriended a freshman in the dorm. He was just a tiny thing. He looked like a 10-year-old. 
He had to look way up to see the upperclassmen. In fact, his nickname was Tiny. Everybody in the school called him Tiny. And he used to worry about how, you know, the other boys at that age were all getting their spurt and growing up to be men. And he was still this little tiny guy. And he used to worry about that. Am I ever going to start growing? Everyone else is. What's happening? But you know, I don't believe all that worrying ever made him grow one bit. But to his credit, he was a frequent visitor to the cafeteria. Nothing wrong with his appetite. And so he kept on eating. And when I saw him a number of years later at a homecoming, he was a strapping young man. I didn't even recognize him. I said, yeah, tiny, that's me, right? <laughs> Big man, he was taller than me. Worrying about your Christian experience won't make it grow, but feeding on the word will. Spend time feeding on the word. And so, folks, every day, let's spend time. Let's spend some time with our marriage partner. Let's spend time with our children. Let's spend time every day with Christ. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different incomes. We all have different talents, different responsibilities, but we all have the same amount of time every day. All of us have exactly the same amount of time every day. And we will find time to do what is most important in our lives we somehow work that into the equation. At the United States Air Force Academy near Colorado Springs, there's a tradition that takes place before every football game. They bring out their mascot, a falcon, on the arm of the trainer. The trainer walks out to the middle of the field. The hood is lifted off of the bird, and the falcon is released. It begins to fly, it goes higher and higher and higher in a great wide circle across that great stadium until finally he's only a speck in the blue. And then at the proper time, the trainer takes that leather lure on the end of that long cord and he begins to swing it around and around and around his head. And that's the signal way, 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 way off in the distance the magical eyes of that great bird see the swinging of that lure and he folds his wings and he plummets toward earth at over a hundred miles an hour. And he spreads out those wings just at the last moment and sinks his talons into that lure and gets right on to the arm of that trainer. How do you teach a bird to do that? He was free. Nothing holding him back. It takes a lot of work to train a falcon like that. It's a very special relationship. Every single day, the handler must handle and fly his bird. And even on the days when the weather is too rugged and they cannot fly, he must take that bird into his arms and spend hours stroking it. Missing just one day can erase months of hard work. So that's the way it is with loving anybody. It takes time. Daily, it takes time. I love you, son. Dad, I don't want you to love me. I want you to play catch with me. Love takes time. Would you talk it over today, just now, with your Lord? Would you maybe be willing to make a covenant with him that this week, that this month, perhaps for the rest of this year, this last half of the year, 2020, you'll spend time every day, quality time, with your partner. You'll spend time, quality time, every day with your child 
and most importantly, that every single day you will make time to spend with Jesus in your worship time. Every day, feeding on the word, feeding on the bread of life. Let's pray. Our dear loving Father in heaven, each one of us today has got exactly the same amount of time, 24 hours in each day, to get done what we need to do, what we want to do. And we always find a way to get accomplished what's most important to get accomplished on any given day. Lord, help us to understand today that we need to spend time in our families, husbands and wives, parents with children, that we need to spend that time every day if our love relationship is going to grow and be stronger and be exciting and be vibrant and never get boring. Help us to find that time every day, Lord. And especially, Lord, my prayer is that each one of us will make a commitment today and stay with it every single day that we will make time, that we will spend with you alone with your word in prayer and that every day can be an opportunity to grow our love relationship with you. None of us would think about missing our meal today. And yet we starve ourselves for a whole week from Sabbath to Sabbath often without getting any nourishment from your word, from the bread of life. Lord, help us every day to keep feeding on your word, to keep growing and building that love relationship with you because we see that love takes time. May each of us commit to taking that time with you today and every day is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.